All right, yes, thanks for still being there. Rock City 101.9 FM in the city of Abekuta. Yes, and indeed, this is the voice of the people. Citizens Forum this morning. Um, this is the second Monday of the seventh month, year 2017. We have uh, going to give you an interesting, exciting uh, edition, and of course, very very informed edition uh, this morning as we have with us a journalist editor activist trade unionist in actual fact he was a former secretary general of african trade union congress and secretary general of the nigerian labor congress mr away lakefa is here with us i'm dili ayodo and I am Toby uh, Joseph. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, after a uh, quick text, I said we'll be looking at the state of the nation. Uh, because uh, the person we have in the studio has introduced to uh, our daily is someone that can actually uh, look at uh, various, uh, various, uh, various issues that affect uh, uh, our national life. Is it uh, the uh, ongoing debate about restructuring? Uh, the endless agitations coming from the southeast about uh, the actualization of uh, uh, a sovereign state or republic of Biafra, or the endless agitations for resource control and uh, marginalization, uh, degradation of environment in the Niger Delta region, uh, which of course has culminated uh, severally and uh, several times uh, into militancy, kidnapping, and of course. Uh, and less agitations in that uh, region. Uh, the issues of uh, quick notices uh, issued uh, left, right, and center uh, to different uh, groups, ethnic nationalities across the country. Uh, the very, very disturbing situation in some states uh, where their governments are finding it difficult to actually take care of uh, its workers and, of course, uh, the citizenry. Uh, some governments have not even uh, apologetic about it, talking about uh, payment of uh, worker salary, uh, talking about uh, corporate deductions, talking about pensions of uh, pensioners. These are labor-related issues. Uh, what exactly is labor doing uh, to actually make sure that uh, these governors are held uh, accountable uh, to the people, especially as it affects a uh, worker's salary. You also know that there are ongoing consultations. A committee has uh, been set up uh, by the federal government with the organized labor and, of course, the private sector. The governors have already uh, submitted its own representatives uh, for uh, negotiations as regards the new minimum wage, which is being proposed by the NLC at 56,000 naira. How realistic is that with Nigeria battling economic recession? So many of these issues is what we'll be looking at this morning. Uh, actually, the labor, the two labor, or three major labor centers now have jacked it up to over 100,000. <laughs> I think it's just appropriate to start from there because we have this great unionist uh, with us, Mr. Lakemfa. The tripartite uh, committee is expected to, be, to begin work this month. Uh, Labor federal government and the NECA employers and then the governors. Really, like to say, is that realistic? Is Labor serious about that, their position? Well, good morning and um, good morning, listeners. Um, the thing about industrial relations is about negotiations. You know, you you want to negotiate, you want something, and then you ask for it, you, you discuss, you negotiate, and you come to an agreement. That's it's a normal thing. Now, whether 56,000 is realistic or not, it's a different issue. But you realize, I mean, everybody agrees, for instance, that 18,000 does not make sense. You yes. get it. And uh, whether 56,000 makes sense is a different thing. But you see, there are a lot of factors that affect uh, the wages. First, we're a dependent economy. We import almost everything. That means that when you have devaluation of your currency, it affects the entire, you know, the contract system and the workers. It affects everybody. So uh, it will not just be a question of um, having a new minimum wage, but also we need to actually uh, restructure, to use the common parlance now, the whole thing about our economy, really. 
we, we need to be to to be a bit independent we need to provide our own food so we can you know uh, ensure that part of our foreign exchange is uh, is conserved we, we we need to to refine our own petroleum products so as to ensure that we get maximum for what we're doing we need a lot of things so minimum wage is a part of it and don't forget it affects mainly workers what affects workers affects the entire society affects the entire country these are the people in most states who go to the market to ensure you know send their children to school so once the economy of the worker is uh, is certain the economy of the rest of the populace is likely to be certain also so uh, there, there's some connection i, I like that uh, what affects workers so that, that's why some people now knocked labor uh, each time they call out for strike related relating to um, their salaries and people have said it's time for labor organized labor unions to change their style and approach to issues they should take up more responsibility the labor leader will tell you their concern is about their union their members welfare and people have said that your members welfare should also include good governance you should also include good condition of living not just for you within your environment which labor has tried it's only when you have governments or employer not paying their salary owing them that they come out to agitate when things are actually going down like i mentioned good uh, bad governance and others so they turn their uh, eyes right into the last uh, attempt for government to draw them into politics also was there when they created the labor party do you think the style and approach of organized labors to issues in this recession do you think it still can be said to be appropriate well i think um labor over the years has tried a lot if you talk about the issue about uh, you know fuel and the, the prices of petroleum products it affects everybody talking about the social economic system it affects everybody they've been broad-minded but I, what I see, what I've seen in the last um, few years is a lack of focus, you know. Uh, Labour must set its own priorities, must set its own agenda, mobilize the workers and the rest of the populace around that agenda. The agenda of Labour might not be the agenda of the government in power. The government in power is interested in running the system. The Labour unions will be interested in ensuring that people, you know, get the maximum benefit from the country. There's some level of contradiction between the two. The labor unions do not need, you know, to balance anything in terms of what the interests of workers are. The interests of workers have become the interests of the populace. But the interest of government is not necessarily the interest of the populace. There is usually a difference. So I, I think the labor unions must, in my view, have their own programs, you get it, have their own agenda and sell it and pursue it rather than rely on the politicians who when they are, you know, when they are full, you know, we'll call you to come and, uh, you know, see what they are doing. It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. Now, um, Kamala Kenfa, let me take you to some very more contentious issues that are so, uh, cause a lot of ripples in the polity. First, what do you make of the continued absence of uh, Mr. President? And of course, the debate that his absence has created a gap or a void that is difficult or hard to feel if you look at the issue of governance in Nigeria and the onslaught against corruption? Well, um, we are all human beings and we can fall sick any time, even without notice. And so um, it's now for the system to be able to run, for the government to be able to run. It's, it's a normal thing, anybody can fall sick. And uh, when people talk about the other president, I, I smile because even those who are not very healthy, you know, uh, they just they just slump and go and get off and uh, before you know it they are gone. So it's not really a question of age or sickness and it's about the government running. And I think uh, we we you know we should separate the individual from the government. In my own view, we should separate the individual from the government. I think those running the government should run it well. It doesn't. It should not really matter whether the individual, that the president, is around or not. No, is that you have a program you, you know, which you sold to us. You have an agenda, implement it. Don't start some assaults like they are trying to do or the structure it. It, it, does, it doesn't make sense. Things are very clear, you know, and then you, you should pursue it. And I think um, some of the altercations between National Assembly and uh, the executive is so unnecessary. They're just wasting our time, really. Uh, 
there are no issues with us as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. When you talk about restructuring, are you of the opinion that it is uh, nothing but an opportunistic uh, uh, cliche now that some politicians are using to either negotiate themselves into power in 2019, or you really think that Nigeria needs restructuring before we move forward? You know, as human beings, um, the Yoruba say that education, you, you know, there's never an end to education, and that's when the, even when you die, they tell you look, when you get to heaven, just eat what they are eating there also. Don't think your education has ended. So, also, is the whole thing about restructuring. Human beings will always adapt one way or the other, or bring new agenda, or try to improve. It's a normal thing. Once you, and if it happens to human beings, it happens to countries, it happens to nations. Every country in the world has some political challenge or the other, and they may need to restructure, to remodel, or to re-energize. But something must happen, because all countries are geographical entities. They are all created by human beings. Every country, every state is an artificial creation. And so when you artificially create something by human beings, you, you may not have a perfect system. So it will always continue, it will go on continuously. So um, talking about structuring, you see, everybody in a society must have a sense of belonging that you are wanted, you know. And like I tried to mention somewhere last week, you cannot have a country where somebody thinks it's a landlord and the other person is a tenant. No you will have problems. Everybody in the country, all citizens own the country collectively. And so when people start making you know, doing agitations or making agitations, you must listen to them. You must listen to everybody. It's like in the family, even if you're a dozen, and, it's, and the youngest child starts making problems, you must find out what's wrong with him or her and try to ensure that something is given to him. So, you know, so that's, that's the whole thing. That, that's the same thing about the country. And I tell people that there is no end to the structuring of either the human being, economy, or a country. There is no end to it. If today you have five or six countries emerge from Nigeria, you still have the claim for the structuring. You get it. Assuming the the western area, for instance, where we are, becomes a country. You get it. You still have people you know talking about oh you know the Jebus are taking over and the, the Egbados are not uh, in charge and. You know, the other people are not doing this, or the other people, the, the lonely people are coming with their jamba. You know, it's a normal thing. So, because there are also natural prejudices that people are, you know, you have to come to terms with these things and find how you can aggregate opinion and try to move the country forward. It's, it's normal. I'll tell you that even if your house becomes a country, eh, you see the habitations within it. Even if you, your village becomes a country. You see our relations within it. But it does not mean that people who are raising things about restructuring do not have points. They do. You know, they, they might feel a bit at. And sometimes it might be perceptive. You get it. Somebody may just feel that look, I'm, 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 uh, people think I'm a fool. You get it. Like some of the objections I find from the Eastern Nigeria is like, oh, they don't think we can also be president. Now, even if a liberal man becomes president, it does not mean. The, the, the fortunes in the East will change. But there is a perception. And people want to get the feeling that, oh, we're also part of, we also produce. Mm -hmm. You get it? So we have to, a lot of these things may have to do with simply listening to other people and trying to do something for them. But, but do you think there is a nexus between the agitations for Biafra and the possibility of having an Igbo president and then the new cliche, which is restructuring, that the Ohanese and Igbo are now pushing forward. Well, let me first tell you that if the East were to become a country, it will become even a, as ungovernable as Nigeria is. <laughs> and I'll just give you an example. You find that uh, the EBC area, there is uh, an archbishop, you know, from Waka, and the war has been on, even when the papacy intervened to say, look, this man is the bishop we sent to you. They say, no. That the man's Igbo will not be understood very well by our people, so we don't want him. <laughs> That's even <laughs> amongst them. The so, so, yeah, so it, it, things don't really change that much. Now, I think part of the problem has been that the some of our people from the East have abandoned or neglected their people and their aspirations. And so you find upstarts, you know, come up with all sorts of ideas, you know. I, I can't imagine that. An area that produces Zik 
Oichino Achebe. Who love and Kano, you know, become a It doesn't make sense in terms of logic, in terms of in terms of education, in terms of temperament, in terms of you know civility, you know, it just it just doesn't make sense. But you see, it's like any leader would do, so long as so long as it says what we want to hear, you get it. That's part of the the problem. So I think there is a serious issue about agitations in the east, which the rest of the country must pay attention to. We must pay attention to it. Uh, but not all these rascals talking about ultimate or no. Uh, they are just they are just jokers. You get it. But once our people are angry, no matter where they come from, we must listen to them. Now, uh, Comrade Lakifa, let me take you back to January 2012. Uh, Nigeria had what uh, we called Nigerians occupying Nigeria, and one protest believed to be the most potent since the return of a democracy, the fuel agitation. You are an insider. On that occasion, you were part of the mobilizers and the organizers. As suddenly, Nigerians believe, just as we were ready to go eat all, uh, all that you, when I say you're not lucky fan, I've said yeah. the leaders capitulated. What really happened on that occasion? Thank you very much. You talk about capitulation, it's uh, surrender to. <laughs> um, you see, to me, when you go on such such uh, things, such campaigns and such battles, it's like you are going to war. Now, I think you must always say, what are your objectives? What do you want to achieve? And I tell people that, yes, as popular as the January 2012 protests were, and I was on the streets in many parts of the country, our objective was actually to ensure that we reduce the cost of you know, petroleum products, especially fuel, back to 65 then, you get it. The objective was not to remove the government, to overthrow the government. No, it wasn't. You get it. Now, but the, we, we, it was so successful, and people were so angry. They started looking for, say, look, if, if it's possible, let this government go away. But we are in labor, we ask ourselves, if the government were to go away or give way, what replaces it? We in labor, we are not in a position to take over. That will even be unconstitutional in any case. So, at one way or the other, it had to be brought to an end. Now, at the point where the government became frustrated, the government actually felt, and uh, some of them told me, they were trying to remove them from power. They actually said so. They, you know, that there are all sorts of conspiracy theories. So it, it, it was normal. But when it got to a point where the president now asked the armed forces to take over the streets, by any means necessary, including using live ammunition. We have to ask ourselves, if, you know, the eve of that, do we want bloodshed on the streets? Do we want to take on the government? Yes, in a number of states, we were, we were capable of actually seizing, you know, those areas, like in Lagos, like in Kano, we, we had people on the ground who were going to stand. But the question is, what are our objectives? And if we if we do that, and uh, there was bloodshed, it was like that the government would go down because of the hunger, the anger amongst the people. But what happens after that? What happens if the government, you know, fell? Can we take over? The answer was no, because it would be constitutional. But there are those who unconstitutionally can try to take over, and so we have gone through. You people are... Yes, we have gone through all that before. And we, we, we should uh, be old enough to realize that any unconstitutional takeover of government will lead, you know, to tragedy. So we have to sit down to say, okay, fine. Let's make the compromise. Mr. President, you have done this, but we want you to reduce the price. And the man brought it down to 97. It was like a pirate victory. Because let me tell you, that protest, in my view, undermined that government. Because the government, of course, went out to say, look, nobody should listen to these guys, just go on. And then you find that your streets, you know, were full of people. A place, uh, you know, as commercially viable as Lagos, you found ladies bring out their beds on highways and sleeping and playing music. <laughs> so it was a sort of referendum against that government. So, it, you know, it, it, like I said, it was a pirate victory. 
But it wasn't that uh, it was a Nigerian factor that would be so that no. We have to ask ourselves what are objectives, what do we think can happen, what do we do? So no Ghana must go was dropped or was offered. As far as I, I, if it was offered, it was not to my knowledge. And yeah. I wasn't a participant and I was not a beneficiary. There was also the story <laughs> that um, guns were also put at your people said to make Comrade Omar announce that call off of that strike on that occasion. Uh, no, there wasn't. Uh, because I was present throughout. No, there wasn't. There was no. Well, there were no more pressure on you. Normally, when you go on strike, I call a country out on strike and uh, mass mobilization. And don't forget the strikes we call that were not just about workers not going on strike. I mean, going to work each other, but a country mobilizing yes. themselves and all those things. It's like a state of emergency. So everybody will be under pressure. Uh, everybody under pressure. Everybody, people, you know, people will be sent to you, all sorts of people, all sorts of uh, leaders are sent to you, and then you, everybody is saying, look, save us. <laughs> now, the, the other leg of that question is, do you think those threats, in quote now, what's it at the end, judging by the outcome of that strike? Well, I, I, I think so. Because what we fought for then, um, we got 97 and I, we were asking for 67. Today we are paying 145. Well, that, that's, the old, that's the old thing, you see. I, I think uh, at any given, you see, there will always be there will always be struggles amongst human beings, how to make life better and all those things. So, uh, I think one of the things that happened, uh, you know, was that the government that government could not take us for granted any longer. That government will not just wake up and increase prices. You get it. So, uh, I think to that extent, uh, and then the old thing about mobility of self consciousness, Nigerians knowing that they are power, which was one of the things to try to let them do that. Look, no. That look, if you are mobilized sufficiently, you can you can force the government to do anything in the interest of the, pub, of, the of the public. Because sometimes uh, those in government may not understand what we are saying. First, as you know, they are not usually they are not hungry people, you know, and the, the masses are usually people who are who still have very little to eat. So we may not have the same thoughts and other things like that. So it's uh, telling the, the the people that look, you can force government to to listen to you. You can even force them to take certain decisions, and it's possible. And that's one of the things that that, that strike achieved. Comrade Akepa, your experience in labor activism now spreads over 33 uh, decades, now over 30 years. Um, you've seen it all, been to the peak. Will you say you are proud of the present crop of labor leaders we have? It's difficult to say so because, like I said, labor must have its own agenda and its own program. And uh, which you can then pursue, but if you then have to wait for the government, then you are you are, you are a problem. I see, for instance, uh, labor leaders carrying out protests on the uh, corruption. I, I don't really understand that when workers are not paid salaries. I think the greatest corruption you can have in a country is uh, people being uh, working and not being paid. One month, two months, three months, one year, and then you find the labor leaders carrying out protests with support corruption to fight against corruption. It doesn't make sense to me. The first fight and if their responsibility is to the worker, and the worker must get his salary, must get his pay. You know that's part of the problem. I see. I, I think they should have their own agenda, set their own agenda, let people buy into it, and pursue it in respect of whoever is in government. Come uh, Kenfa, I want you to please be very frank with us as regards your own assessment of how labour has been able to uh, sensitise the people, and of course. Uh, protect the interests of the people. Uh, why am I saying this? Um, from, from when we look back at uh, <coughs> said, the first subsidy protest and so many other issues uh, that, of course, have uh, required labor defending or coming out to criticize government and fighting uh, for the people. Uh, do you foresee uh, a situation whereby in the nearest future? There will be a situation whereby labor will have to spearhead a nationwide movement or protest uh, in solidarity with the people. And then the people would, because of lack of trust, refuse to participate. It depends, you know, on a lot of factors. But the first thing is that I think labor must also be political. It must have its own movement also. And if possible, its own political party with clear agenda. That's what I believe. 
Now, whether workers, uh, the people will listen to labor or not, will depend on so many factors, including perception, including understanding, including the confidence. You get it. I, when when I was in the NLC, um, when you call out people, you are confident that they are going to listen. I remember we had about six strikes when Abbasanjo was president, you know, and uh, they were very serious uh, things because he was a bit temperamental and uh, he even accused us that time of trying to move his government, you know, and other things like that. So, but we succeeded because people believed in us. You get it? So, I could go out and uh, even our even leaders at various state levels, you know, um, once they, they believe that you are going to move them forward, they will go with you. And that's part of the thing. So I think a labor leader must be credible. A labor leader must be willing to take risk. A labor leader must be willing to lead and not think about what the governor is going to say or what the say to the government is going to say, you know, or what the president is going to say. No. You know, in other words, I believe that a labor leader must know who his primary boss is. And that primary boss are those who are putting in power. You get it. So your responsibility, primary responsibility will not be to the government of the day. It has to be the workers and what they want. So when you have that kind of thing, which was what we enjoyed in, in that 2012, people have con had confidence in us. I could then move them forward. But it's, it's when they don't have confidence that, you know, the state governments can also come in and say, you see, this person is run, is you know, his APC that is behind it, or his PDP, or that is like that. They're able to divide them. And so the only issue about the focus now and other we things, lost. you know, with the lost. Now, things. let me take you to Niger Delta issues. Um, even though uh, that region could have said to have enjoyed uh, in our six years uh, presidency in the mode of uh, the Jonathan presidency, there are still agitations, there are still uh, <laughs> underground moves to uh, see if uh, they are really, uh, to have a, a, a think, and of course, uh, take a second look, whether they have a fair share in uh, the entity called Nigeria. How can we totally address the issues of underdevelopment, economic uh, degradation uh, in the Nigeria? I think it has to do with the philosophy of government, it has to do with our laws also. Um, you find that in the Niger Delta, despite all that they are producing, they are very little, you know. So it has to do with those kind of, those kind of problems. But more importantly, it has to do with the issue of our gov of, of how we structure our government and also the issue of, um, you know, revenue allocation and also the leadership. Like you said, the Niger Delta had the leadership for about six years. But you find that um, it might not have made a difference, even if they didn't have the leadership. And that's what I'm talking about, the people from the East also. You can just have a president for eight years, and you see it will not change anything in a fundamental manner. You get it. So, so that's part of the problem. The whole problem about Niger Delta is about lack of jobs, infrastructure, and development. And so anybody can come out and say, look, we are producing 90% of our this thing. We do have it and then people follow them. And usually a lot of these citations are for individual benefits. You get it. So so there are, there are, there are those problems. The problems of the Niger Delta, in my view, are not you know, radically different from the problems of Nigeria. And I think part of the problems of Nigeria is about mass education. I mean, uh, employment also. It's about infrastructure development. It's about the right to food. If you don't, if you have a country where people do not know where the next meal will come from. I I went to Kano some years ago and I went to the motor park, you know, where the FGC Kano is. And when I came down, I was going to Abuja. About 20, 30 youths, you know, simply swarmed on me, seized my bag. They want to, to they, 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 they didn't even know where I was going in any, in any case. Now, these are just guys who wanted to get maybe a naira or two from the, the driver. And I looked at it. At the motor park, there must have been about three, four hundred youths. And the vehicles there are less than 50. So I told myself, there are some of these boys who have been running across the street. 
we will not take anything home and we have no food. And so when a person like uh, Yusuf came up and said, look, uh, we are brothers in Islam, so come together. And you know when you go to their camp, you are going to have at least one meal. He was like to have uh, followers. So it's a major problem. Yes, the, the, the food there. The uh, Yusuf, Boko Haram, yes, yeah. the, the, the Boko Haram leader. So I think we have, we need, in a country like Nigeria, everybody must be guaranteed one meal a day. Everybody. And we can do it. Everybody must be guaranteed access to medical, you know, care if they need one. Everybody must be guaranteed. But there, there are situations where these youths have also shown that what they want is easy money. Uh, for instance, former President Lutcher Papa Sunday was adamant, but he was not uh, disposed to um, the amnesty for this Niger Delta militants. In 2009, when Yara came, he offered amnesty, and that went on, um, and appears to have not solved anything as to militancy in that area. So, uh, will you really say that is the core problem or the policies that have not just been placed rightly? Well, President Basanjo's attitude to the to militancy in Niger Delta was to adopt the military system. Same place to bomb your country, send soldiers, and people died on both sides. So if you ask me, the strategy of uh, President Yaradra was far more superior, far, far. And, and now... But we still have restiveness uh, increasing. You, Those you, militants go breaking and increasing in numbers. But you find that the kind of wars that we had under Basanjo are not going on. There are no wars actually in Niger Delta. It's been replaced by kidnapping. No, the kidnapping had always been there for ransom for money. And the kidnapping in Niger Delta is not as rampant as it is in Eastern Nigeria. Or even in a place like uh, Kogi State. <laughs> or the Kaduna Abuja Road. You get it. So I, I, I think I think the Yara Adra system was far better. To see, look, these people are grieved. They have some, you know, uh, things that have to be addressed. So what do we do? Now, the success or otherwise of that on the long run would be a different matter. But it was a far better situation. As in so let, let's discuss the success yeah. of the ability of that uh, program. You consult for them, you have a bit of uh, an idea of how it operates. Do you think it's something that should be continued? Well, the well the, yeah. Well, I, like I said, under, under President Obama, there were wars. Now there are no wars there. You had a lot of armed conflict, now there are no armed conflicts there. You get it? And so under President Obasanjo, you, you, you had oil production coming down to about 700,000. Now it's again about 2 million. So even for the country's economy, it's, it's a far better thing. But on the long run, like I said, it's about development. There must be mass employment and things for people to do. There must be jobs. People must have the right to go to school, should have schools to go to. When you have things like that, then it might be better. So if you're going to look at the success of the amnesty program, I think first it's about you know having some peace in the Niger Delta in terms of the lack of armed conflict. That is very important. Because that armed conflict meant displacement of people, destruction of even the military infrastructure available, and your inability to even pump any oil to sell. So that's uh, yeah. No, good. okay, so 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 that's one thing that is very clear. The second thing is that. The amnesty program was set up because there are some development agencies that the government has. Whether they are working well or not is a different matter. For instance, the NDDC, you know, to build structures and all those things. You have the Ministry of Niger Delta. These are the agencies that are supposed to help with the, the construction infrastructure. And now it was impossible under Basanjo to do that because you send anybody there, Julius Berger, everybody there, you're kidnapped. But now people can go back there and work. So there are some things like that. But I tell people that things like that cannot go on forever. There must be a point we get to. Now it's like it's like a child. You're winning the child off, you know, breast milk. So something has to be done, you know, to ensure that that happens. But you you cannot, in my view, have a solution to Nigerian data crisis without a solution to Nigerian crisis because they are all, you know, they are all tied and we have actually the same problems really. If you say they are tied. Should do, do you think the youth, the militants there, should continue to blame federal government 
for their problems and woes rather than the local leaders. When I say local leaders, uh, the governors and other political heads that have come to give them promises and that have come to rule them. No, it will not be about uh, sharing blame. Because if you talk about blame, then the oil companies that, you know, get away from that place and put virtually nothing are also, you know, in part of the, the part of the problem. So we, we, we have, you know, it's to, it's to see that, look, we have a crisis. What do we do about the crisis? We have problems about education. What do we do about education? We have problems about infrastructure. A lot of the places have no water. You know, though they are they are they are living in the creeks. What can we do about pipe water? A lot of the children don't go to school. What do because when children don't go to school and there's no future for them, what would they do? They will look at the people coming as people who are prosperous and you know start start kidnapping and other things like that. So we need a modified um, um, a, a coordinated uh, approach to it all to ensure that uh, we move, we, we develop the area. If we don't develop the area, we're wasting time. Well, some people have also said uh, some of these uh, calls, but it's just a cosmetic. For instance, if you're insisting that the capital, the headquarters of those oil companies should be located in the Niger Delta, the production is there uh, already. Are they, those are not uh, cosmetics. They, so they, now they are being trained. Mm -hmm. Uh, in various uh, skills, which will help them uh, assist in production of oil itself. So, uh, are they not cosmetics uh, arguments? Well, usually cosmetics are not uh, things that are very negative. That's why you know we may also use them. Yeah, we just to, to, them. to cover the no, no, no. It, it may not, it may not be. But, 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 but uh, you know that's a letter sign. Uh, no, you see, when you are look, you are producing oil. And people come and extract it and just take it away, and they are there in Lagos. You you may have some sense of, you know, it's again like the eternal thing. You are, you you know that you are being you are being suppressed and repressed and oppressed. You can have that sense. That look, why are these people out there in Lagos when they are personal, where their official facilities are here in Nigeria Delta? So it, it it has to do with perception also. But beyond that one also, don't forget that the other companies. Pay a lot of taxes, and some of the state governments think that if these taxes come to them, they will they can use it to better develop these areas. There are those questions like that. Where there is an old question about employment, some of the youth in Niger Delta look say, look, most of the oil workers are not from Niger Delta. So if you have a headquarters here, we must have a percentage of people working in those places. These things have to do with again people having you know, experience some anger, and you understanding that anger, and say, asking yourself, how do I switch this this problem? I mean, them. You know, those are matters. So, if they say, look, we want the headquarters here, it may make sense to say, look, why will you stay in Lagos, and then you take the oil in the Bayasa, and then move out? You get it. It may not be fundamental, but like I said, cosplay changes can also be changes, but you can then make it skin deep, so that. Everything then, uh, you know, and comes uh, together over all the uh, development yeah. Yeah. of that region. All right, uh, you're still uh, listening to Rock City on 1.9 FM. It's uh, Citizens for a Multi Day Break Show. We have uh, in the studio the former General Secretary of uh, the Niger Labor Congress NLC, a veteran and journalist, as it were. Uh, we will go to a short break for the national news at 10. And after the national news, we will come back. I guess we'll still be here in the studio then you will have the opportunity to be part of our discussion. You can start sending your messages to 32120. Just type rock, R-O-C-K, leave a space, type your message, include your name, and forward it to 32120. Our social media platforms are also available on Facebook, Rock City FM 11.9 is our fan page, and at Rock City FM is our Twitter handle. Keep tweeting, and of course we'll be back. Stay with us. Of 10 Daybreak Show Rock City 101.9 FM in the city of Avicta Cities from this morning. We have with us in the studio a veteran journalist, editor, media consultant, liberal unionist, former Secretary General African Trade Union Congress, former Secretary General of the Nigerian Labor Congress, Comrade Owei Lakenfa. All right, we straight on open the telephone lines for you, the listeners. Let's get what you think, questions, if any. 
you want to react or okay. answer some questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, um, Mr. Godfrey, talking about unpaid salaries, it's a, it's a very serious matter, really. It's not something we need to debate about. When I was in uh, labor, you know, we didn't have that crisis. Um, but the crisis is on now, so we need to actually, you know, uh, respond to it. It's a very serious matter. So if a man goes to work and he has no income, he can't take care of himself or his family. So I agree with that. And uh, Mr. Lushola Johnson on the mechanized farming, you know, I agree with him, you know. Um, with the resources, if we have resource control, would they be well run? I think they will be run like the Nigerian state is being run today. So we actually. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody will say essays. Well, <laughs> well, I, I can say that just say it's not it's not being run well. That's mm -hmm. that's the truth. And um, so you 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 need the philosophy. You need the constellation of ideas to run a country. And uh, once it's not being run that way, you can just retire for all these uh, chances. So it's uh, it's it's um, it's a reality. Big Daddy talked about government not doing any, everything, but we are saying that what is the government doing? Government cannot uh, exist without doing nothing. It has to do something. And uh, the whole idea is that a government must, in my view, must cater for the basic needs of the citizenry. It must provide food for at least one day, like I said. It must provide, you know, education. It must provide healthcare service. It must provide pipe bone water as basic things. You know, that's the duty of government. And uh, please don't let us get carried away by this whole thing about privatization. Privatization, at least in Nigeria, is about uh, a few people taking over the natural resources and uh, the other resources of the country that belongs to all of us. And you can see that in everything that has been privatized so far. You do not even know what the funds, I mean, the money that we realize from privatization, what it has been used for. It, I, I don't think anybody knows. We also know that uh, PSCN has been privatized and uh, the power sector has become worse. In fact, the discos have done so much disco that um, they have gone bankrupt, you know. And the reality is that if we are going to have any success in terms of power sector in Nigeria, we must take over these things from these discos and gencons. That's the, that's the truth. Um, I think Mr. Kilani from Kuto, um, the old issue you raising is about, you know, federalism. Nigeria is the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That's what we are. But as you know, we run a unitary system. And that is why a lot of these agitations have come forward, because the federating units of the country have been abandoned. The whole thing about federalism has been abandoned. And what you have is the unitary system and everybody trying to take a share you know, of the pie. That's the problem we, we really have. That's my own view. Uh, thank you very much, Ola Dosu, Ademola. Very grateful for your comments. Uh, people who have been journalists in the last few decades will be very sad about what is going on in Nigeria today because a lot of the media, in media organizations, especially the newspapers, don't even pay salaries. So when you have a journalist who is not paid salaries, how does he earn an income? He has to earn an income by doing things that are not professional. That's the truth. So we, 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 have, we have serious challenge in the media. Uh, people must be paid salaries. And I think the Nigerian Union of Journalists must rise up to that occasion to ensure that their members are paid so that we can have a better country. As for the labor movement, labor movement in Nigeria is, uh, I think, is is on the low end today. But from my experience, the Nigerian Labor Congress is one of the best in Africa. A lot of labor centers in Africa are under their various governments, and you find very little agitation going on. The type of vibrancy you find in Nigeria is absent in many countries. But that is not to say that we are doing well either. We can, we can actually do far, far better. And so the way forward, like I said, is that we need to have any group, including labor, must have its own agenda and its own program, which you can then sell to other people, or other organizations, or anybody coming to government to say, okay, you want us to vote for you, whatever party you are, these are the things we, the minimum. And let's agree. And if you don't agree, then you, you part ways and uh, do something else. In any case, you are not suffer from having our own labor movement, I mean, our own political movement. We need that really. Uh, can we check out the messages? Okay. Um, well, Latunji says, uh, okay, I think that's, this has to do with uh, the critics. Uh, Ajakore says, good morning. I agree with the 
issue of restructuring. Restructuring is necessary on the sectors, budget and planning, system of government and power, but should not uh, lead to disintegration. The federalism of Nigeria or a civil war ensues. So let's follow history from 1914. Okay. Yeah, restructuring is important at this time around at this time around to harness peace and tranquility in Nigeria, but unfortunately most of our leaders and elders are suffering from self-centeredness syndrome because they lack the fear of God, thereby aggravating this uncalled for agitation here and there. But the government needs to do the needful to forestall chaos to enable Nigeria to move forward. That's coming from Cosmos in Goshen Estate. All right, Yavi Da Vinci tweeted this. I agree with most of the submissions of Commodore Wayla Kempfer. I've read him for years and I expected no less uh, from him. All right, keep the messages coming and also the tweets. Let's go back to the calls. Uh, 0809 868 7344. Uh, mainly with uh, the submissions of uh, Mr. Benson on the National Assembly. The question asked by Mr. Kambi on the sack of labor leaders, I think uh, it's like uh, in, in labor that would be treasonable. <laughs> because if, you, if, if your leaders are sad and you cannot fight for them, then you're in trouble. That's the end of your agitation. And I think that's part of the problems that uh, you might have in the state like Ogun. On, on all sides, because at the end of the day, if you think you have conquered labor leaders, then you'll have the mob to contend with. And it's not good for industrial relations system. Uh, Honorable Larry talked about um, Nigeria and the restructuring. I, I agree generally with him. We we need to restructure many parts uh, of ourselves. You know, many parts of Nigeria. We need to. And uh, Mr. Taiwo Ayambode talked about the division in the Nigerian Labour Congress. I think um, it depends on what are the reasons for the you know the splits. And what is being done about it? But let me just say that uh, all labor leaders are virtually the same, really. And what they then need to do is, um, like I said, have, have a program, have an agenda. Um, it doesn't matter whether you are one or you are two. What primarily matters will be how you lead the, the workers. And I think it's in our collective interest for the labor leaders to close ranks and uh, solve their internal problems. The internal problems must not be allowed to. It must not be allowed to affect uh, the general interest of workers. Mm. All right, so let's add more calls. We have uh, with us a veteran journalist, editor, colonist, trade unionist, former Secretary General of the Organization of African Trade Unions, and of course a former Secretary General, immediate past really, of the Nigerian Labour Congress, Comrade Owei Lakemfa. Hello. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, well, Mr. Lubenga has uh, it's you know three straight questions: uh, the minimum wage and non-salary payment. Don't forget that uh, for many in government, it's not very profitable to pay salaries because you, you might not be able to get uh, whatever percentage from them. But it is now for the workers and the labor and their labor leaders to ensure and uh, you know, ensure that workers are paid their salaries. It's quite quite uh, important. Uh, pensioners. And in so little, 3,000, 5,000, I think is the, is the fault of the labor leaders. Because um, our laws, even the constitution says that every five years you must review the pension laws. The pension laws must be reviewed in accordance with, you know, uh, the rate of inflation and then, of course, the, the, the wages in the country. So for someone to be earning 3,000, 5,000 and then the minimum wage is 16,000, it's, uh, it's unacceptable. It's part of the problem, I think. Um, we, we have uh, with labor leadership today. Mr. Ayuade also talked about um, curbing inflation rather than the increasing minimum wage. Um, it's, 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 it's actually that you don't, you don't need to leave one for the other. The fact is that the Naira has been devalued. The fact is that there is hyperinflation in the country. And the fact is that the, the minimum wage is too low for us. And so we have to tackle that while also tackling the whole issue about um, about uh, inflation in the country and the uh, economic, uh, you know, uh, policies of government. I think comrades uh, Fatoki and John talked about the same thing about unity. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's it's good that we are united. Um, it is said that uh, one sticker is easily broken, but uh, you know, uh, it will be difficult to to break a pack of sticks. So 
it makes a lot of sense that uh, there is unity. And for those of us who are now outside the labor leadership to talk to our people and encourage them to unite once that is done. But you see, the thing, the thing about unity again, also, it's like unity in Nigeria also. <laughs> so you must listen to yourselves, make concessions where necessary, and then uh, move forward. But don't assume that once you're a majority, the majority can go to well. No, it, it, that, it does, things don't work out that way, especially when trade unionism is voluntary. So we'll have, to, we'll have to listen to ourselves, make concessions, and move forward. Thank you. All right, let's go straight to the messages and the tweets. Um, this one says, can labor tackle any governance on issues of not paying pensions, and deductions, and gratuity, etc.? That's Pius from Shadje. Uh, Allah Allah says, uh, please, what is the position of the legislative arm when the executive were taking decisions on our labor leaders? Thank you. That's Allah Allah's opinion. And um, for the tweets, we have Yemi. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, Messi Femi says, political leaders don't care even if masses don't eat a meal a day. They care for themselves and their family needs from taxpayers' money. Yemi Da Vinci says, Comrade, at what point in the calling for restructuring a nation does restructuring or balkanization inevitable? Is Nigeria there yet? Nigeria needed to have started planning for a post-oil world since 2005. Comrade, what will be the fate of Nigeria and Niger Delta when oil becomes useless? I agree that perception is reality, but Comrade, there was a reason oil companies pulled out of worry. That's why everyone is in Lagos. Messi Femi tweeted, not only Niger Deltas are suffering, all the regions, masses, even there is hunger in the land. Even beggars are on the increase everywhere. The made a venture once again. It's a shame that Nambi Kanu has violated all his bill conditions and no Igbo leader can call him to order. A shame. He's the voice of the Igbos. A Yoruba adage says a peaceful house is one whose bastard child is not yet grown up. Or Hanese should do more in Corbin Kanu's influence. Mercy Femi says, I agree with uh, Kamila Kempfa on unpaid salaries. So this really affected a show West senatorial by election where the PDP won. An angry man is an angry man. Akwede Camille says, We've been saying the call for new wage isn't the best, but we feel to put government on, on, the, on toes to regularize our economic instability. Labor union will definitely call for new wage until all wages and salaries in the country are put under same control. Government is happy to cause division within the labor, within the labor union, and this will continue until the labor leadership puts selfish interests aside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, generally, they are, they are very fair comments uh, you have here and there. Now, the extent of which the structure can lead to vaccination, uh, you know, it depends on how we handle issues. Like I said, once you listen to people and you try to assuage their, you know, then, then you, you may not really get to that level. But uh, like I said, I told somebody about it a week ago. You see, uh, being in a country is like being in a marriage. The same ups and downs you have in the marriage is the same thing you will have in a country. There will be good moments, there will be bad moments. You get it. And uh, if you are too angry and say, no, 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 let's divorce, let's uh, separate. By the time you go and marry and that woman, you find that you are about to square one or it's even... <laughs> Or don't square at all. You get it. So um, we will have to we we'll have to work together. Uh, you know, we, we, we are we're a great country. It's when you go out of this country, you know that we are really great. Now it's better for us to be united than to be divided. But like I said, every new division creates its own, its own majority and minority. You know, so it goes on. If you are not careful, you go on and on like that. I you know, the Soviet Union broke into fifteen countries. And uh, you still have uh, wars in Ukraine and some places. It's still on. You get Chechnya, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Yugoslavia broke into seven countries. You still have wars going on there. So you can break into 20 countries in Nigeria and you still have the same problems. So the better thing is to manage those problems and ensure that you remain the great country you have. When the oil dries in the Niger Delta, we've been told even uh, the demand for oil is already 
going down. So what would be the fit? That's another question. From well, you were talking about uh, post oil fit uh, of Nigeria. I said um, it's something that will come. Oil will definitely uh, stop flowing. Even if it does not, the, 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 yeah, of, of, yeah, oil is a wasted asset. Uh, but uh, we we it, are it, discovering new depot all the time, and then uh, what they call you it. can discover, but for how long will it last? The secondly, the way technology is moving in the world, there will be this, you know. I think it's oil. the demand that is going down. Uh, people complaining about environmental pollution. No, beyond that, you see, there is there is frack, uh, you know, going on in the U.S. and it's, it's bringing a lot of oil. But beyond that, also, is that technology is moving. But in the next few years, you find a lot of cars also don't need oil. <laughs> you don't need fuel. So, but we, as a country, we are not prepared for it because we take everything we have, we spend it, and wait for the next allocation, and that's what happens everywhere. So, when oil dries up or it does not sell then we are going to a serious crisis. So we still have a window of opportunity to, to plan for it, to plan for a post-oil Nigeria, to plan for, I mean, we should also look at other resources and what do we do? Uh, if we don't do that, by the time there is crisis in the oil sector, we, we'll be in crisis. All right, it's about six minutes to the hour of 11. That means we have less than six minutes to... I think both, uh, MKO and Paul will be talked about restructuring. The, we will restructure, but even if we restructure today, we still have to restructure tomorrow. It's something that is continuous, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, for the labor leaders, they, they will need to be careful because uh, they need credibility to be able to run the unions. It is not the business of labor leaders to start awarding, making their work to govern. Best governor of the year, best governor of the century, all those things are not uh, really uh, in the interest of workers. Thank you very much. All right, Toby, do you have anything to add to you? Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, so we must uh, first appreciate our guest. We brought him all the way from Abuja, Comrade Owei Lakefa, former Secretary General of the Nigerian Labor Congress, former Secretary General of uh, the Labor Unions in Africa, and of course, economist, editor, journalist. We say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for this privilege. And of course, to all of you that have been a part of it, yes, the parliamentarians we call ourselves, you are also part of the success story. Dele Ayodo is my name. I say God bless you all. God bless Nigeria. God bless Rock City. And I am Toby Joseph. Have a wonderful Monday.